spoke out the stars ablaze. Only one could breathe life into clay. Only one can quiet raging seas. Only one has power to breathe. a great rendition of Only One, and that is the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church Quartet. That's uh, Jeff Warren, Mike Proctor, Tommy Bartlett, and David Swore, and doing a great job on that. Only One. 
Good evening. Welcome to another King James Bible study. This is our Tuesday night prophecy edition, and it's Tuesday, September 17, 2024. I'm Dr. Joseph Speciali, and thank you for making our Bible study part of your day whenever it is that you're listening or watching this uh, lesson. We know you could be doing a number of different things, and you've chosen to study God's Word, and I greatly appreciate that greatly appreciate it. We trust that you're enjoying the study of the book of Daniel. We're going to get into that in just a minute. Don't have uh, any but uh, one announcement to share with all of you in, in the event that you didn't uh, uh, get a chance to listen to our Mount Pleasant Bible Institute study last night. Uh, we are having a revival uh, the end of the month, September 30th through October 2nd at our home church at Mount Pleasant. Uh, Pastor C.T. Townsend is going to be doing the preaching, and so if you're a member of the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, you of course want to be there. If you at all can be physically present, you need to be there for all three of those services, again, Monday, September 30th through Wednesday, October 2nd. If you're not a member of our church and you're still in the area, uh, we welcome you, especially if you don't have a home church. You come on out anyway. If you have a home church, you be in your home church on Wednesday, the 2nd of October. But if you can, come on out Monday and Tuesday night and join us for the revival meeting. All services will begin at 7 o'clock, Monday through Wednesday. There will be special singing. I don't uh, know if CT is going to be bringing his dear wife Becky with him. And, that, and if so, if they'll be doing any singing. But I know this, our choir will be ready to go, as will a slew of special singers. As you uh, just heard, our quartet is available. I don't know that they will be singing, but we have a bunch of wonderful groups within our church. Uh, not just our quartet, we have the Swore family, Arrows of Grace, uh, Daughters of Salem, just to name a few. Uh, a lot of good uh, solo singers as well. Kelly Moles. Uh, I mean, I could go on. I don't want to leave anybody out. We've got a lot of great singers uh, and musicians. So if you come, you will not regret it. The flesh will, will tell you to stay home, get, a, get some extra sleep, whatever. You had a long day. But if you come out, the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church, September 30th through October 2nd, there for these services. You will not regret it. I guarantee it. The singing, the preaching will be fantastic, and I have no doubt that the Spirit of the Lord will be present. If you're unable to make it, pray for this, Pray for these meetings, okay? Pray for these meetings that the Lord has liberty to move and work. Souls be saved. God's people be revived. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get into our lesson tonight as we're in Daniel chapter 5. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for Jesus. We thank you that he is the only one, that he is worthy of all power, honor, and glory. For he's created all things, and for his pleasure they are and were created. And uh, we just thank you tonight for loving us so much, Lord, and, and saving our souls when we were yet sinners. We thank you for the privilege we have tonight to study the Word of God in the book of Daniel and ask, Lord, that you bless the study and preparation that's gone into this. But uh, that alone is not enough to deliver to your people. Uh, absolutely surrender myself to you, Lord, and ask that you fill me with your Spirit because it's only in his power that the Word of God can be delivered through teaching or preaching and, uh, and for it to bring forth fruit. Only you can do that. We pray that uh, you bless each one that's joined us at whatever time that they're listening to this, and pray that whatever needs are on their hearts, Lord, that they're calling out to you for, whether they have health issues or uh, lost family members, uh, things on the job or within the family that need divine intervention and deliverance. We, we ask that you be a very present help in their time of trouble, Lord, and deliver them mightily and all to the praise of your glory. Bring out everything you want to be brought out in today's lesson, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 
And most importantly, if you are listening to us and you're not saved, you want to hang around till the very end because we're going to give you the opportunity to receive Christ. You do not want to put that off. All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Daniel chapter 5, Daniel chapter 5. And last week we started into an introduction to Daniel 5, giving you pretty extensive secular history information because there's a pretty good time gap of about 25 years between Daniel 4 and Daniel 5. Uh, so we wanted to fill that in as best we can with what we have of secular history. Of course, the, the history is uh, questionable. It's certainly not certain. One of the best sources of history that you're going to come across in, in trying to collate history with the Bible is the Jewish historian Josephus. And so we often uh, reference him when we talk secular history. We'll be doing that again tonight. Matter of fact, we might actually be reading directly from Josephus tonight, from his work against uh, Apion. Okay, uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, tonight we're going to pick right up on that. We didn't quite finish all the historical information, so we're going to give you that. We'll do a little bit of a review here on uh, Belshazzar and Nabonidus, and then we're going to give you a little bit of secular history before getting back to the divine text in Daniel 5, if that's okay. All right, so just by way of review, Daniel 5 is talking about the heavenly handwriting, the handwriting on the wall, right? And last week we shared this uh, genealogy with you, and we want to repeat that here tonight just for the sake of context. Um, because what we have here in Daniel 5 is very clearly Belshazzar is ruling on the throne in Babylon the very night that Babylon falls to the Medes and Persians. Yet secular history tells us that the ruling king of Babylon at this time was a man named Nabonidus. Now, how do you resolve that apparent contradiction? Which one is the king of Babylon? Well, the Jewish historian Josephus actually believed that Belshazzar was another name for Nabonidus. In his work, The Antiquities of the Jews, he says in Book 10, Chapter 11, Section 2, referring to Nergal Shalrezer, he says, And after him the succession in the kingdom came to his son, uh, Labasordacus, which is another form of the name Labashi Marduk, who uh, you see on the genealogy chart on the screen there. He's the son of Nergal Sharizer, um, who continued in it in all but nine months. So Josephus indicating that Labashi Marduk only reigned on the throne for nine months. He goes on to say, and when he was dead, it came to Belteshazzar. That's his form of the name Belshazzar, who by the Babylonians was called Nabonidus, or Nabonidus as we know. Against him did Cyrus the king of Persia and Darius the king of Media make war. So you will find that in Antiquities again, Book Ten, Chapter Eleven, Section. Two. So uh, Josephus honestly believed that Belshazzar is just another name for Nabonidus. Okay, that Nabonidus was uh, his Babylonian name, and the Greeks and all referred to him as Belshazzar. Secular history says something different than the secular history of Josephus. The rest of secular history contends that. Nabonidus was Belshazzar's father, and that's that's pretty much what I'm inclined to believe, okay, based on uh, the sources I've studied and even from the text of Scripture. And that in spite of the fact that in Daniel 5, and we mentioned this last time, Belshazzar is referred to as Nebuchadnezzar's son in verse 22, okay? And then no less than five times, Nebuchadnezzar is referred to Belshazzar's father in Daniel 5, namely in verses 2, 11, and 18. Now, unless otherwise specified by virtue of context, we should always assume that 
that if the Bible refers to a son or a father, that it's speaking of a literal direct descent, okay? Um, but we know from the study of Scripture that a father can also be a term that's used to describe a grandfather or even somebody of even further previous, um, in the, uh, further uh, on in the, in the genealogy is what I'm trying to say. Same thing with the word son, where a son can also refer to a grandson or somebody much further along in the descent of the genealogy, okay? So it doesn't have to be a direct descendant in the sense of a first generational offspring from that father, okay? And I believe that's how it's used in Daniel 5. I believe that Belshazzar is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, why do I believe that? Because in the book of Jeremiah 27, verses 6 and 7, uh, prophecy was given that the, that Nebuchadnezzar, including Nebuchadnezzar, there would be three generations of his bloodline that would rule Babylon before the 70 years that God had allotted and appointed to Babylon to rule and for the kingdom of Judah to be in Babylonian captivity, uh, that three generations would rule. Jeremiah 27, verse 6, And now have I given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beasts of the field have I given him also to serve him. And all nations shall serve him, and his son, and his son's son, until the very time of his land come. And then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. Now we know in this particular prophecy, the word son and son's son could not refer to grandsons or son-in-laws or in, in all of that although it could it doesn't and the reason we know it doesn't is because if we were to count all of those who ruled on the throne of babylon that were not just nebuchadnezzar's son but were a son-in-law and a grandson and so on you have more than three generations so you have nebuchadnezzar he is succeeded by his son Evil Merodach. Evil Merodach is succeeded by his uncle, Nergal Sharizer, who is uh, Nebuchadnezzar's son-in-law. I'm sorry, not Evil Merodach's uncle, his his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law. Because Nergal Sharizer marries ne one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, Kashaya. Okay? So Nergal Sharizer being a son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar could be counted as a son. He then is succeeded by Labashi Marduk, okay, being Nergal Sharizer's son. You might make a case that he is a, a descendant of Nebuchadnezzar through in-law relations, but let's not even in include him. But after Nergal, after Labashi Marduk, then you have Nabonidus, okay. And Nabonidus is another son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar. He is, okay? So if you're going to count son to be not just sons, but son-in-laws, and Nabonidus also counts because he married Nebuchadnezzar's other daughter, Nidacris. And they had a son named Belshazzar. So count them up. Nebuchadnezzar would be one generation, then evil Merodach two. Nergal Sharizer would then be another, Nabonidus another, and Belshazzar would be number five. That ain't going to work. To fulfill the prophecy in verse number seven of Jeremiah 27, it has to be Nebuchadnezzar's actual bloodline. And so that would be Nebuchadnezzar, his blood son, evil Merodach, and then his blood grandson, Belshazzar a blood grandson to Nebuchadnezzar through Nebuchadnezzar's second daughter, Nidacris, and her marriage to Nabonidus. There you have it. So him refers to Nebuchadnezzar, his son to evil Merodach. His son's son is Belshazzar. Okay, three generations. 
So we would have to disagree with Josephus in that Belshazzar is not the same as Nabonidus. He's the son of Nabonidus. And we still, we still like Josephus as a secular historian. We do. I still believe he's the best by far, um, the most accurate, okay? But he, he's not infallible. Now, um, another reason why we don't believe that Belshazzar and Nabonidus are the same person is because Belshazzar offers to make the man who can read and interpret the handwriting on the wall that we're going to study in chapter 5, he offers to make him the third ruler in the kingdom. There's three different instances where that's mentioned in verse 7, verse 16, and verse 29. Why would, he, why would he offer to make him third ruler? Why not fourth ruler? Uh, why not second ruler? In fact, if he was the king and wanted to really make the offer sweet, then he would offer the person to be his right-hand man, his, uh, his uh, viceroy, if you will, second in command, which is what Pharaoh did with Joseph, isn't it, in the book of Genesis? When Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams, Pharaoh gave Joseph a gold chain about his neck and made him to ride in the second chariot. And that's because Joseph was the ruler over Egypt besides Pharaoh himself. He was second in command. He was the prime minister to Pharaoh's presidency, if you will. Okay? But that's not the case here. Belshazzar can only make, in this case we know it would be Daniel who would interpret the, the writing on the wall, but he can only make the one who could read and interpret the handwriting the third ruler, and that's because Belshazzar, although in on the throne at this time as the sitting king, he wasn't the first ruler. He was exercising the power of the throne because the one who was the first ruler, his father, Nabonidus, was absent at the time. Belshazzar himself is a viceroy, a vice-regent. Okay? So all he could do legally by the throne would be to make the individual the third ruler in the kingdom. Okay? So we believe they're two different people. And Belshazzar is, as secular history attests, the son of Nabonidus. He's ruling on the throne because it's clear from Daniel 5, Nabonidus is not present in Babylon, which is an amazing thing when you think about it. Because the, in Daniel 5, we're not talking about um, a year or a month, a week, or even just a matter of days before the fall of the Babylonian Empire. We are talking about the day it falls. The events of Daniel 5, this festival that Belshazzar has for all of these nobles here, it is later that very same evening that the armies of Cyrus the Great breach the gate in the walls of Babylon, come in and take the city and slay Belshazzar. And yet... The king, the first ruler, Nabonidus, is not on the grounds of the city. Why? Where is he? The Bible doesn't tell us where he is, at least that we can tell. Okay? We, we, if, it, if it's in the Bible, and it could be, uh, no one has uh, theorized or put forth a theory uh, as to what reason that was. So we can turn to secular history again and get some options to see what it was, what the reason was. But it's clear he was not there. And because he wasn't there, Belshazzar, his son and co-regent or viceroy, was the ruling king. Now, uh, Josephus, we mentioned him in his work against Appion, uh, suggests uh, a, a reason why Nabonidus was not present. And the reason for that, and I find it interesting that he has a theory on the absence of Nabonidus in against Appion, because in Antiquities, he suggests that Nabonidus and, and Belshazzar are one and the same person, just two different 
names attributed to them. So I don't know what's going on there. Nonetheless, turning to his other work against Appion, and uh, this is in uh, book one and uh, chapter 20, I believe it is. Okay. And we may read it directly here, but let me summarize first. What he, what he uh, uh, suggests here is that Nabonidus leaves the city of Babylon. He had come back, first of all, because he, he knew that the, that the Medes and the Persians were an imminent threat. Uh, he leaves the city at some point thereafter his return uh, because he hears that Cyrus and the armies are approaching very close from the northeast. And so Nabonidus takes an army out of the city of Babylon to meet Cyrus in battle. And they engaged in battle at a place called Ophis. Ophis. I'm sorry, Opus, not Ophis. Ophis is an Egyptian god, I believe. They engaged in battle at the city of Opus, which is located about 50 miles north of Baghdad. On the Tigris River, and I think we may have a map of that. Here you go. Um, so you see, uh, we don't have Baghdad here, but Baghdad is on the Tigris River, so you're going to be somewhere about in here. All right, so Opus is right here on the Tigris River, about 50 miles north of Baghdad. Um, in this battle, Nabonidus and the Babylonians were routed. And Nabonidus subsequently fled to the city of Borsippa. Now, on this particular map, you see a city marked as Sippar. That's not the same. Uh, that's not the same as the city of Borsippa that we're referencing from Josephus's work. Borsippa is located actually south of Babylon itself. Um, Cyrus then marches to Babylon, takes the city without a fight. We know that from Isaiah 44, verses 27, through Isaiah 45, verse 1. And if our understanding of those prophecies are correct, uh, what happened is that the, the Lord enabled the gates of the city of Babylon to be opened to Cyrus the Great um, from within. And prior to that, what caused the gates to be opened was that the, the riverbed of the Euphrates River was stopped up. Okay, quite an engineering feat was accomplished by Cyrus's engineers and the men on the ground there. And they stopped the flow of the Euphrates River underneath the gate of Babylon. And so they were able to walk under the gate into the city undetected. Imagine that with all the watchers on the wall that should have been keeping watch at the time. And they got in under the gate and then opened the doors to the gate of the city and poured in and took the city. More on that in a minute. Uh, so after Babylon falls, according to Josephus and against Appion, uh, Cyrus then marches to Borsippa to besiege it. But Nabonidus, rather than engaging him in battle again, comes out and actually surrenders to him, and surrenders him with a degree of congeniality. I mean, he's very um, polite about it, okay, and subjective. I'm sorry, not subjective, but subjugated. Um Cyrus, if you've done any study on the history of Cyrus, especially in, in lack of a better term, a biography written of him by Xenophon called the Cyropedia, if to any extent Xenophon's portrayal of Cyrus is correct, and I believe it is, Cyrus had a tendency of, for those of his opponents, his rivals, his enemies, who surrendered amicably, that he would treat them with tremendous mercy, many times sparing their lives, okay? And that's what he allegedly did for Nabonidus, okay? Uh, Josephus believes he, that Cyrus graciously treated Nabonidus by sp not only sparing his life, 
by sending him into exile to Carmania. And some believe that Cyrus actually appointed Nabonidus as governor of Carmania. Now, whether he did that or not, we don't know. But uh, most secular histories indicate that Nabonidus died in exile. Okay? So, let's go ahead and we'll read an excerpt from Against Appian so you can hear it firsthand rather than my summation. Okay? And I'm going to use the names as we know them as opposed to how they're written by Josephus, so you know who I'm referring to. Okay? So, from Against Appian, again, Book 1, Chapter 20, Sections 151 through 153, it says, When Nabonidus perceived he, meaning Cyrus, was coming to attack him, he met him with his forces, and joining battle with him, was beaten, and fled away with a few of his troops with him, and was shut up within the city Borsippa. Hereupon Cyrus took Babylon and gave order that the outer walls of the city should be demolished, because the city had proved very troublesome to him and cost him a great deal of pains to take it. He then marched away to Borsippa to besiege Nabonidus, but as Nabonidus did not sustain the siege, but delivered himself into his hands, he was at first kindly used by Cyrus, who gave him Carmania as a place for him to inhabit in, but sent him out of Babylonia. Accordingly, Nabonidus spent the rest of his time in that country, namely Carmania, and there died. So there you have it. That's from the Jewish historian Josephus. Um, let's turn to a couple of other historical sources. The Nabonidus Chronicle. The Nabonidus Chronicle records that prior to the Battle of Opus, Nabonidus had ordered cult statues from outlying Babylonian cities to be brought into the capital city in order to avoid their desecration, destruction, and plunder by the Medes and Persians. Other sources believe that he recalled the idols in order to muster protection over the city of Babylon from Cyrus. Regardless of the reason, there seems to be a, um, a, uh, a consensus that knowing that an attack on the capital city of the empire was impending, that Nabonidus ordered the idols that were patron deities over uh, various Babylonian cities to be brought back to the capital city. And basically what it meant to those Babylonians was they were, as those, those idols meant as patron deities, they were protectors of the city. And in so doing, Nabonidus was basically relinquishing, surrendering all of those cities to Cyrus in an effort to spare the capital, okay? Um, then, according to Xenophon, I mentioned him earlier. Uh, again, a, a Xenophon, a very reputable historian in his biography of Cyrus, entitled the Cyropedia. I recommend that reading if you're a history buff and you want to read something that is related to Bible history. In reading this biography of Cyrus, I highly recommend it. Okay, uh, I think I mentioned in a previous lesson that a, a couple few years ago, I think it was during the pandemic, we were actually it was prior to the pandemic, right before the pandemic, so it had to be 2019. Uh, we did a series of lessons on the four Gentile world empires. Uh, we never did finish that, by the way, because of COVID. Uh, we got up to the death of Alexander the Great, I believe, but we we did Babylon, we did the Medes and Persians, and again, Greece up until the death of Alexander the Great. But in studying the, the uh, empire of the Medes and Persians, uh, I, I read Xenophon's Cyropedia, as well as a number of other uh, history sources, including Herodotus and all of that. And I can tell you that coming from a Bible mindset, and judging the work from somebody who's used to the infallible truth of Scripture, I found Xenophon's biography of Cyrus far more believable than 
even Josephus, what Josephus writes about him, and absolutely far more credible than Herodotus. That's not to say that everything Xenophon says is historically accurate, okay? Uh, he very well may have embellished things positively for Cyrus. Uh, so that's why I, I conclude that if even just it's 75% accurate, and, and I believe it is, um, Cyrus is one of the, the greatest military leaders in all of history and one of the most um, gifted leaders, period, military or otherwise, one of the most gifted leaders in history. In fact, he was studied, and I believe Xenophon himself, his work on Cyrus was what was read and studied by Alexander the Great. Interesting. And part of uh, Alexander's preoccupation with Eastern culture and all of that, uh, which proved part of the reason for his downfall and, and untimely death, uh, was due to his admiration of Cyrus as portrayed by Xenophon. I believe that. All right, so Neb Nabonidus Chronicle, again, reports that the idols were brought back to the city from other Babylonian cities in order to protect the capital. Xenophon in his Cyropedia states the following. As Cyrus and his armies made their way to Babylon, a man named Gobrius, spelled G-O-B-R-Y-A-S, G-O-B-R-Y-A-S, Gobrius, who was the governor of the province of Gudium. Okay, you see that on the map we have on the screen, right there in the upper right-hand corner. See, Gudium right here, G-U-T-I-U-M, pronounced Gudium. So, the appointed governor of that Babylonian province is a man named Gobrius. Well, according to Xenophon, Gobrius, um, who as governor is paying tribute to Babylon, to Belshazzar, to Nabonidus, they're paying tribute to them, um, goes out and greets Cyrus as Cyrus is marching. See the arrow coming through Gudium here, coming down to Opus? Well, as Cyrus is comes to Gudium, Gobrius, the Babylonian governor, comes out to greet him, not engage him in battle, but he's looking to betray Babylon, particularly Belshazzar, okay? So he comes to Cyrus and asks, he, he makes a deal with him. He says, I want to get vengeance against, and Xenophon terms him as the son of the king of Babylon, a reference to Belshazzar. He's the son of Nabonidus, who really was the first ruler or king of Babylon. The reason, Belshazzar had killed Gobrias' only son. And that's in uh, reference in Cyropedia, Book 4, Chapter 6, Sections 1 through 4. All right. Um, elsewhere in the Cyropedia, Book 5, Chapter 2, Section 27, Belshazzar is described as being young and possessing cruel insolence at the time that he began to reign. So getting back to the deal between Gobrius and Cyrus. So in exchange for killing the king of Babylon's son, so Gobrius is saying to Cyrus, if you kill Belshazzar, okay, if you agree to do that, I will give you my castle here in Gudium as your quarters, and I will start giving the tribute that I was passing on to uh, Nabonidus and Belshazzar. I'll start giving it to you. Not only that, I will join your army, and I will lead you into the city of Babylon. I'll lead you in there. And that's in Cyropedia Book 4, Chapter 6, Sections 8 and 9. It's at this point that Cyrus directed Gobrius to speak with another man named Gadatus, spelled G-A-D-A-T-A-S. Gadatus. He wanted him to speak with him and form an alliance because Gadatus also had a beef with Belshazzar. 
Remember, we mentioned how uh, uh, Xenophon had mentioned that Belshazzar had cruel insolence. He, he was brutal. Well, Gadatus' beef with Belshazzar was Belshazzar castrated him and made him a eunuch. That's referenced in Cyropedia Book 5, Chapter 3, Sections 8 through 10 and 15, for reference sake. So between them, Gobrius and Gadatus, they're the two men who serve as the tour guides, if well, not a not a tour guide, but they lead Cyrus's armies. They lead Cyrus into the city of Babylon when the gates are opened. Because they, they need to go to the royal palace. They need to know how how most efficiently and stealthily they can get there and kill the king, kill Belshazzar. And Gobrius and Gadatus are the ones to do that. Okay. Um, so they're the two men who lead the armies into the city when it fell. Uh, Gobrius and his men actually, and this is according to Xenophon again, they pretended to be fellow revelers. Remember, the feast is going on at this time. And you might ask, what on earth were the watchmen doing at this time? Shouldn't they? They knew the Persian armies were coming. Why weren't they on the watchtower looking out for these guys? Well, we'll talk about that when we go through verse by verse in Daniel 5. We'll talk about that. Okay, There's a reason for that. But the, the festival's going on. And so when they come through the gates, they pretend to be fellow revelers, okay, and make their way straight for the royal palace, okay? Gadatus and his men were the first to rush in when the gates were opened uh, to the royal palace itself, okay? First one's in, so they're leading the way. And so they take the, the contingent of troops right on up to the very quarters where Belshazzar is, and when they open those doors, Belshazzar is said to have been there with a dagger in his hand, and they proceeded to kill him and all of his bodyguards around him. That's Cyropedia, Book 7, Chapter 5, Sections 24 through 30. What's interesting is that while Xenophon very uh, um, finally describes the fall of Babylon to Cyrus, as well as the death of, of, of Belshazzar, uh, he does not mention the fate of the actual king of Babylon, Nabonidus. I've read through it, and, and I may have missed it, but I couldn't pick up on it where he mentions it at all, which is very interesting, but still a, a very good history. Now, if you have a Schofield reference Bible, uh, and look at the reference note for Daniel 5.31, where it talks about Darius the Mede taking the kingdom of Babylon. Uh, it'll indicate that there's some people who, who state that Darius the Mede was Gobrius, the very Gobrius I just shared with you, the former or the governor of the Babylonian province of Gudium that betrayed Belshazzar and Nabonidus to Cyrus. Okay? and very responsible for uh, expediting the fall of, the, of, of Babylon, okay? Um, of course, Darius the Mede uh, is not Gobrius. We will talk about the identity of Darius the Mede when we get to chapter 5, verse 31. We will. We'll talk about all the theories regarding his identity. It's quite controversial, but I believe yet quite clear when you take in the whole of Scripture, okay? Um, we're going to have to wrap it up here, so let's go ahead and, and wrap up from the Nabonidus Chronicle. The Nabonidus Chronicle records regarding the Battle of Opus that it took place again on the banks of the Tigris River in the month of Tizri, or Tishri, okay? which corresponds to, on the Gregorian calendar, September, October, somewhere in there. So again, we, we mentioned in the previous lesson that the events of Daniel 5 are almost taking place 25 years to the day of the death of Nebuchadnezzar. Almost 25 years to the day. Okay, Not quite, but just about. 
The Nabonidus Chronicle does not provide any details regarding the Battle of Opus's course, so very little is known about the actual events of the battle. What seems clear, though, is that it was, it was a rout, that Cyrus and his armies just routed Nabonidus and whatever army he brought against him there. Okay, um, We're told as well that following this resounding defeat, Nabonidus fled to the city of Borsippa, located about 11 miles southwest of Babylon. So I mentioned that you don't want to pay attention to this phonetically similar city name here, Sippar. That's not Borsippa. Borsippa is going to be 11 miles southwest of Babylon, so somewhere right about in here on our map, okay? So that's where he flees. It's on the east bank of the Euphrates River, and he remains shut up there until the, after the fall of Babylon. It's shortly thereafter that Nabonidus was captured, although some historic, although historical sources do vary on the manner of his capture. Some say he came back to Babylon and was taken into custody. We already read from Josephus against Appion, where um, Cyrus actually went to Borsippa, besieged the city, and without a fight. I mean, he began to besiege the city. Nabonidus just surrendered, came out very peaceably and amicably and surrendered. Okay, The Babylonian historian Barosus agrees with Josephus in that Cyrus spared Nabonidus' life and sent him into exile into Carmania, where he died years later. So there's two historical sources in agreement, and absent of any evidence to the contrary to consider, uh, we're inclined to believe that that was indeed the case for the time being. That, unlike Belshazzar, who was brutally slain for resisting, Nabonidus was spared by Cyrus and died in exile. All right, so we're told in Daniel 5, verse 1, that Belshazzar made a great feast to a thousand of his lords. You remember there was there's also a great feast in the book of Esther, chapter one, made by Ahasuerus, which who we believe historically is Xerxes the first. Now Belshazzar, when we gave you his his uh, biography uh, last time, we mentioned how he frequently held festivals as a means to try to curry favor with the people, because his father Nabonidus was absent. Um, not only that, he had an affinity for Assyrian deities, and that brought him in much disfavor with the people. So to try to help the popularity and favor with the people, he would hold festivals and do his best to try to restore uh, favor with the patron deity Marduk. Uh, this particular feast here wasn't necessarily a feast for all the peoples. I mean, all, all of Babylon was participated in it to a to a degree. But here in the royal palace, it was invite only, folks. But boy, it was huge. A thousand people. A thousand lords. So this is a feast in the royal palace for the elites and the elites only. And you and I have seen enough of that in recent years to know what that's like. Washington, D.C., you, you've got to be among the elites to be in the know, don't you? So you got 1,000 nobles in attendance for this feast, so it, it's quite massive. The fact that it says that Belshazzar made the feast implies to me that this isn't one of the regular festivals of Babylon, like the Feast of Marduk or the feast that commemorates the death of Tammuz okay, in December, which is uh, uh, basically a forerunner to the, uh, to the Roman Saturnalia uh, or a lot of what we hold in Christmas traditions, unfortunately. Uh, this festival was a spontaneous one that was announced by Belshazzar. And given the imminent threat posed by Cyrus and his armies at the time, the absence of Nabonidus to likely engage him in battle, the thought of hosting a massive festival at this time seems presumptuous at best, and absolutely foolish at worst, but he did it anyway. And it says, drink wine before the thousand. Well, we're, we're told in Proverbs 31, verse 4 through 5, it's 
It's not wise for kings to drink wine and princes strong drink, is it? Well, Belshazzar's loading up. And the implication here that, you know, calling him out and drank wine before the thousand, calling him out for his drinking, I think the implication here is Belshazzar not just being a proud and showy host, but he's engaged in drinking contests. He's showing off his ability to, or his lack of ability, to hold his liquor. Hmm, interesting. All right, we're going to have to stop it there. We'll stop it there for tonight. And we'll pick up on verse 2 next time. All right, if you're listening to us and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, let me appeal to you here tonight. Uh, please don't put off receiving the Lord as your Savior. Death is imminent. The coming of the Lord is imminent. And we just do not know uh, when death may be coming and knocking at our, at our door. And so please don't gamble with your soul. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for your sins on Calvary's cross, was buried and rose again the third day, if you believe that you're a lost sinner and that if you ask Jesus Christ to save you, you put your faith and trust in him, that he would save you, then you need to do that tonight. And so here's the plain, simple truth. We are all guilty sinners under the penalty of death, folks. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That's physical death and eternal death, spiritual death. And that's because sin is not just a physical act. It is always rooted in the spiritual. It's always spiritual. And so we are on our way to hell without direct intervention from the Lord. But he loved us so much that he did intervene. He made a way for us to be saved. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago to be born of a virgin, live a sinless life, and then lay down that life, not just his physical life, but spiritual life. He died spiritually on the cross as well to pay that awful price for your sins and mine. Romans 5, 8 says that God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so Christ paid the price in full and rose again the third day, and his resurrection is proof positive that God the Father has accepted his death for our sins as payment in full for all of our sins. And because that payment is now made, eternal life can be offered to anybody, anybody, as a free gift. Romans 6.23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life. Here's the catch. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. You don't have eternal life now, but it's available to you now. It becomes yours as a gift from God to you when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. you got to come through him. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. And so if you're willing if you're willing to receive Jesus, if you know you're a sinner, you don't want to go to hell, you're sorry for your sins, and you believe Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again, and he'll save you if you ask him, then all you have to do is ask him. Put your faith and trust in him, and you'll be saved. Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. So if you're willing to do that, pray with me now. Dear God in heaven, I confess that I am a lost sinner, and I do not want to go to hell. I thank you for loving me so much to send your only begotten Son, Jesus, to make a way for me to be saved and go to heaven. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me so much to pay that awful price and dying on the cross physically and spiritually for my sins. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again the third day. And I believe that what you did is enough to pay for all of my sins and forgive me. And so the best way I know how, I'm asking you, Lord, to please forgive me of all my sins. 
and come into my heart and save my soul. Transform me from the inside out. Help me to live for you. I'm trusting you and you alone to get me to heaven. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, it's not, again, not the words that saves you, but if you meant what you were saying as you were repeating after me, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You're saved right now, the moment you put your faith in Jesus. All right, well, that concludes our study for tonight and another week with that as well. Hard to believe. And so until next time, folks, we ask that you would study to show yourselves approved unto God, put on the whole armor of God, and be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord. We love you and we're praying for you. We trust that you'll do the same for us. Until next time, we'll leave you with a little bit more of the quartet singing only one. Good night, folks. Oh.